Hello, this is Jonathan Burnside here to talk with you about behavior trees. Before we get into behavior trees, we kind of got to talk about what is a behavior. A behavior is any way an agent thinks and acts, which is purposely very broad. A lot of things could fall into that. Um, our behaviors can be very simple. Um, one, one action, one simple action, touch nose, play animation, walk forward, raise arm, um, super simple one, one pass actions. Or they can be compositions or collections of other simpler behaviors and actions um, that result in something more complex. Uh, often walking to a given location would be a composition of behaviors. So maybe there's doors in the way. I can't just walk through a door. I have to check, oh, well, I'll have to open it. But I have to test, is it locked? And if it is, I'll have to find a key and move the key back to the door and then use the key. Um, so these behaviors can, can get much more complex and interesting by becoming compositions of multiple other behaviors. Any of our behaviors are going to have a return status of how, they're, how, they, how it went running that behavior, basically. Um, and, and in more specific to programming terms, if, was, if a behavior was a function, this would be its return type. Uh, and it would have three options of that, for that return status. Either success, it just worked out and we're done. Failure, we can't perform that option and we're done. Or running, we're just not done. And we haven't succeeded or failed yet. Um, some of our simpler actions might only ever return success. Touch nose. Well, maybe that's not a bad example because maybe there's a desk in the way or something. But uh, set color, some, some simple action that cannot fail, maybe just return success. Whereas move to might be a common action or behavior we'd have to create. Um, it, would, it would return success when we've moved to the given target. It would return failure if we cannot move to that target. But probably most of the time it would return running as it continues to move the agent to whatever that target is. A precursor to behavior trees um, were decision trees. And a decision tree is just used to help make decisions for your agent to tell it or help it pick what actions it should perform. Um, decision trees ask some question about the world or agent. Um, these are going to be the internal nodes. The internal nodes are all sort of conditional, some question. Um, in the case to the right, the, the root node is a, is a conditional internal node, in this case, asking some question about the world or agent. In this case, it's asking, am I a zombie? And we will branch from there and do different things depending on the answer to that question. Our leaf nodes are going to be our actual actions. So if we go back to that tree to the right, if we answered the question of, am I a zombie? Well, no, I'm not. Well, then I better hide from the other zombies. Whereas if we answered yes, well, I can go to another conditional. Well, hmm, I am a zombie, am I hungry? Well, no, not at the moment, I'm not hungry, so better start moaning, because that's what zombies do. Uh, but of course, if I am hungry, well, now the action would be eat brains or so whatever you need to fill that desire. Um, decision trees can use machine learning. And this is a, it's a broad idea, but basically in sort of generic terms, we mean it can learn from what's happened previously. It can learn. Um, so as an example for the tree to the right, that hungry conditional, we might have some amount of hunger and some threshold at which if you're above, your hunger value is above the threshold, then yes, you're hungry, or no, you're not. Um, conceivably, we could learn from, from what's happened previously that maybe being hungry and trying to eat brains has worked out poorly for a lot of zombies. Well, we could increase that threshold, making it return no, you know, you're not hungry for longer um, based on that, that knowledge of what the agent has learned over time. We could implement things like that. A little beyond the scope of what we're getting into today. Um, of course, de decision trees are, are very useful. Um, in most cases, more, more modernly, we're going to end up using a behavior tree instead for games.
Um, in the behavior tree, we're going to have um, sort of this concept of different types of nodes uh, in the tree that have sort of different results that they're going to do. Um, well, first type would be our primitives. Um, these usually consist of our conditions and our actions. Um, so test some, some state and perform some action. Our decorators are going to change something about their child nodes. Um, and typically decorators only have one child node. But maybe we loop, doing something multiple times. Maybe we wait some amount of time or to the next frame. Or maybe we invert one of those return statuses. My child returns success, well let's invert that to failure. Or my child returned failure, let's invert that to success. And then we also have composites. And these are how we're going to group together multiple um, simpler behaviors, either in sequences, selectors, or parallels, typically. And we'll cover those in a little more detail in a moment. So back to primitives, mostly conditionals and actions. So tell me the conditionals tell some state of the world. Is this door open? Am I in range of target? Do I have the key to the door? Is the door locked? Any sort of thing we might need the agent to know about. Um, and these conditionals are just going to return success or failure um, to, to match with true or false, usually not uh, viable for a condition to return running. Our actions, of course, are something the agent can actually do. We've decided that we should do something, move here, open door, whatever the action is. Um, these primitives, these conditions and actions, are the most uh, game-specific of our node types. Um, we could actually write a behavior tree solution um, that would include all the other node types, but it, for any specific game, from one game to the next, we would very likely have to rewrite um, conditions and actions for our agents to be able to perform. So our decorators change what the nodes underneath are doing. We have a lot of options here. Um, we could loop some number of times. Um, we could actually wait an amount of time. We could invert a return type, changing success to failure and failure to success. And we could retry. Um, ba retry basically means, well, did my child return failure? Well, then do it again. Um, just try again. Uh, we can also use these for debugging purposes. Uh, we can use a, decora a, a decorator node to print out some sort of debug information where it might uh, print out the name of the child behavior and whatever its uh, return status was, success, failure, running. Um, we could also use decorators for thread locking. Um, very common to have some of these, some uh, threading going on, maybe our, our moving code or, or multiple components. Um, we can use decorators in place of thread locks for this as well. Our sequences, as mentioned, are how we're going, or excuse me, our, our composite nodes. The first type is a sequence, but our composite nodes are uh, how we combine multiple behaviors together. Uh, sequence simply plays each child behavior in sequence, one after the other, until one returns failure. As soon as any, any child of the sequence returns failure, the whole sequence fails. As long as each uh, child of the sequence returns success, the sequence will move on to the next child. So in the diagram below, we have a uh, approach enemy sequence behavior where we'll start by locating the enemy. Can we find the enemy? If so, cool, move on. If not, well, then we return failure and we're done. We, if we can't find an enemy, it's going to be impossible to approach the enemy. But if we can find them, well, now we're going to plan a path to that enemy. Um, and if, that, if we can plan that path, well, great, we'll start following that path to the enemy. But of course, if we couldn't plan the path, we won't be able to follow the path. So plan path to enemy, if it returns false, the whole sequence returns false. Um, finally, if the first two return success, we follow the path to the enemy which also could succeed or fail. Um, and that return type will be the return for the approach enemy behavior at this point. 
A selector works very similar to a sequence. We'll have multiple child nodes and they will be processed left to right in order. The, the big difference between a sequence and a selector where the sequence continues running in sequence as long as each, each uh, node returns success, the selector only moves on as its children return failure. It will actually stop as soon as one of them, one of the nodes succeeds. So in the example below, we have an attack enemy selector behavior. We're gonna start by trying to use a gun attack. If that succeeds, well, great. We have now successfully attacked the enemy and we're done. If the gun attack fails, then we'll try the knife attack. If that succeeds, great, we attack the enemy, move on. But if the knife attack fails, we can try another, in this case, a magic attack, which could also succeed or fail. Selectors can also be used to model if statements. If this, do that. So I might want to write a behavior approach if not in range. I only want to move into range of a target if I'm not already in range. So below we can see a selector approach if not in range. Its first node is a conditional is target in range. If is target in range returns true, then we're done. We're already in range. We don't need to approach and approach if not in range will also return success. If is target in range returns failure, it's not in range, well now we'll start approaching the enemy. Approach enemy will return success once it has approached the enemy and now we are in range or it will return failure once we're done and we have failed to approach the enemy. So we can see the code to the right, the equivalent uh, sort of pseudocode to the right. If not in tar target in range, then begin that approach enemy behavior. Um, but what about the else? Else if it is in range? Well, keep in mind, approach if not in range, this whole selector behavior will return success if the target is in range. It will return failure if it is not. That success could be because it was already in range, or that success could be because it then approached the enemy and now they are in range. We can add the else by adding a few nodes on top of our approach if not in range. Um, that approach if not in range is now down at the bottom of our tree uh, in this diagram. We're actually trying to make a new behavior, approach or attack. This is still a selector and it will either move towards the enemy or it will attack the enemy. And we can see um, that approach, if not in range, down the bottom left, remember it will return success or failure, success if we are in range. So if we are in range, it will return success, which goes to the inverter. Which we're, if we were returning success, that will now be failure. In the case of the selector, failure moves on to attack enemies. So approach, if not in range, returns success. We invert to failure and we attack the enemy, meaning he was in range, start attacking. Um, the other portion we already had in approach if not in range, where basically it will test if you're not in range, start approaching. And the result is off to the right, we have both our if and else, either approach the target because we're not in range or start attacking because we are. A parallel node can be used when we want multiple children behaviors to run at the same time. Um, hopefully we know this is sort of a theoretical thing. Our, our computers, you know, we don't really do multiprocessing. They're, they're switching tasks just very quickly from one to the other. So, so we're going to kind of fake this. Um, but most commonly we would do this by, through the use of threads. Or maybe in this case we have an attack enemy, uh, parallel behavior, uh, with children approach enemy, gun attack, and taunt enemy. We would actually start those three different actions. Um, all threads running in sequence for all, or excuse me, all in parallel for all three of those actions at once. Um, so these these ones can be fairly dangerous. I mean, we're we're introducing some threading. We're trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, there's but there are some really common cases where they're going to work out best for you that would be hard to implement otherwise. Like 
running and gunning. I want to move towards the target and I want to keep shooting. Um, that's what we're seeing in this parallel. I want to approach the enemy and continue shooting them as I do. I don't want to walk towards them, stop, and then start shooting. Um, but then we get the problem of, well, how do we know if the attack enemy succeeded or failed? And we're going to have to define some sort of policy for this, and it, it will be different based on our needs. In the case of uh, approaching the enemy in the gun attack, um, if the gun attack is succeeding, we're probably happy. We're attacking the enemy. It doesn't really matter to us if the approach enemy failed or not. Um, as long as we're gun attacking, we're, we're attacking the enemy. So we'd have to define some policy for how this should, uh, um, what the return status should be. Um, do we need all of the children's children to be successful in order for us to be successful? Do we need any certain one to be successful for us to be successful? Um, we use what's called a policy to define that. Uh, these are, these the parallels are, are by far the most complex of our nodes in our data tree. And here, this behavior tree example, I'm going to run through a, a few different uh, passes from one frame to the next and, and see what might happen. So in our first traversal, uh, well, in any of our traversals, of course, we're going to start at the root selector. It's a selector node. We go left to right, and we're going to keep um, processing children nodes until one succeeds. So the root selector is being visited. We'll go to its first child attack sequence. And the first thing it does is check a conditional. Can we see the player? If we remember a sequence continues acting as long as each of its uh, children returns success. So if player scene returns success, which it does in this case, meaning we do see the player, we're gonna move to the next node in our sequence. In this case, it's our gun sequence, using our gun. Um, so first thing in this, we might find ammo. A little weird that we said, hey, I saw the player, now let me go find some ammo. But that's neither here nor there. That's what the AI is doing. So, okay, find ammo. Maybe that's going to take a while. Maybe we have to move to wherever that ammo is. We have to look around the world. It, it might not finish in a single frame. So it's still running. That's its status. We, we started it, go look for ammo, but it hasn't succeeded or failed yet. And that's the end of our frame. So find ammo returns running. Its parent returns running. Its parent returns running. And its parent returns running. End of frame zero. Next frame. Well, we were running last time. We'll have to go all the way back to the running node. We find ammo, we continue processing that action in this case. We have eventually returned success. Now our gun sequence will move on to its next child since the previous one succeeded. In this case, we'll shoot the player and hopefully that will return success as well. And our behavior succeeds for the given frame. And we'll go to the next frame. In this one, maybe we'll go through the same steps. Where each selector starts the attack sequence. We check if we can see the player, but we cannot. The player is not seen, so this will return failure. So the sequence will not move on. Instead, the sequence will return failure. Remember, a selector is the opposite of a sequence, though. When it gets failure, that's when it does move on. So while attack sequence returned failure to root selector, that just told the selector to move to the next one, in this case, our patrol um, behavior. So this might be this first node, patrol hour, hourly, might be some sort of timer node, having him do things on, on some fixed interval. In this case, our, our patrolling action. So maybe our patrolling action, we want them to both whistle and walk around. And these are our unique actions, but we want them to both happen at the same time. So we could use a parallel node here to have both actions uh, activate. So we start whistling and we start the walking around actions. Maybe whistle returns running because we're still whistling. While walking around failed. We couldn't walk around. So maybe we were in a closet or something. 
Um, in this case, our, our policy was set up so that our parallel, or in this case, patrol parallel, would fail if any of these failed. So patrol fa fails, patrol hourly fails, and all the way back up to our root selector returning failure. So benefits and drawbacks. Um, so typically, behavior trees are reasonably easy to understand and control. Um, they, they do scale, though. The, as we're going to get more complex behaviors, it, it can be um, the, the, the complexity of building, of setting up the nodes to get the, uh, the behaviors you want is going to increase as we, as we need more nodes to do that, to do more complex behaviors. Um, simple behaviors, fairly easy to implement in code. But for more complex things to really uh, improve the speed at which these uh, thing, behavior trees can be set up, um, graphical tools are really going to help. You know, can you actually build a sort of tree graph that you could drag and drop nodes in and out and move them around? Um, a tool like that is really going to speed up the development of the behaviors defined by these behavior trees. Um, they're, the behavior trees are, are typically very fast to run. There's very little um, complexity in the actual tree. And that's not to say there's not complexity in the actions you provide, but all those internal nodes are, are fairly straightforward and of low cost. Um, and we can also we can scale this well and reuse portions of the tree. Um, you know, we, we can even have actions that start off other behavior trees or other behaviors. There are drawbacks to everything, of course. Um, or we're basically a reactive. We, we have all these sort of conditionals, much like the decision tree, these conditionals have a, a very strong act, action on what, uh, or impact on what actions we're going to take. Um, it can be very reactive. This, this can be bad, especially for games, if the player can become very aware, if I do this, the enemy will do this, and we can start to sort of game the system if it's too obviously reactive. Um, but we can make more complex, uh, better sort of conditionals for that. Um, we can introduce some, some randomness in cases. Um, we can even add some sort of priorities and values that, that may adjust on these conditionals to make it a little less obviously reactive. Um, of course, adding a little random in makes it completely not predictable also. Um, the naive versions also always traverse from the root. So this is uh, specifically pointing out the, the case of when things uh, an action node was uh, still running. Um, the next frame or the next time we try to process the behavior tree, we still have to start at the root, even though we're all, all, always going to move to that one that was currently running. Um, but that's just the naive version. That's not to say you can't set this up in a manner that, that knows what node it left off on last frame or last update or whatever, whatever that concept is um, to begin at that point again later. Um, the average tree is very powerful, very useful in games. Um, totally cool thing to use for, for uh, planning your, your, your behavior of your, your agent. Um, if you're getting really complex, you're probably going to have to implement some, some tools as well. Um, the, the tree itself, not too complex to implement, but actually trying to create um, really complex, in-depth behaviors. If you don't have a good sort of graphical tree or something to, to really see what's going on, it's gonna, it can get very difficult and tricky to figure out what's happening. So, so at a small scale, Probably can live without some tools, but but for a real game, you're you're definitely going to need some sort of some graphical tool for this setup. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Good luck.